I want you to turn with me this morning to Matthew chapter 15, and we'll read a portion, and then we'll pray together. Matthew chapter 15 and verse 21. And Jesus went away from there and withdrew to the district of Tyre and Sidon. And behold, a Canaanite woman from that region came out and cried, Have mercy on me, O Lord, son of David. My daughter is severely possessed by a demon. But he did not answer her a word. And his disciples came and begged him, saying, Send her away, for she is crying after us. He answered, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. But she came and knelt before him, saying, Lord, help me. And he answered, It isn't fair to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. She said, Yes, Lord, yet even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. Then Jesus answered her, O woman, great is your faith. Be it done for you as you desire. And her daughter was healed instantly. This is the word of the Lord. Shall we bow together for prayer? Just uh, to ask you to be quiet in the presence of God a moment. Be still and know that he is God. The greatest of meetings becomes the smallest when Jesus is there. And the smallest becomes the greatest. May we all be conscious of his death. Lord, for this beautiful morning. Just as the sun is shining outside, may the sunshine of your love blaze in our hearts. May the Holy Spirit have complete control of all of us. Without you, we are helpless. We can do nothing. Thank you, Lord, for BSF, all that it means in this and other lands to many people. Thank you, you are central to it all. We pray that the impact that this movement has made may be greatly increased as a result of these days in your presence. And therefore we pray, speak, Lord, for thy servant here. Speak just now a message to meet my need which thou only dost know. Speak now through thy holy word and make me see some wonderful truth thou hast to show to me. For Jesus' sake, Amen. I hope um, you're hearing me all right. As I speak about that volume, okay? If I speak too quietly, you can't hear, just raise one hand and I'll speak a little louder. If I speak too loudly, I nearly blast you out of the building, which is much more likely because I get excited. Just raise two hands in horror <laughs> and I'll quieten down. <clears throat> It's wonderful how the Lord keeps the good wine to the last. And he certainly has been bringing my wife and I to this great convention. We have spoken, needless to say, to some that are bigger and some that are smaller. But I don't think I've ever been conscious of speaking to one which is more strategic. 
and an immense privilege. It's a great responsibility. It doesn't help towards sleeping at night. <laughs> but um, with a burden on my heart to discharge from him to you, we are continuing a series of messages under the general theme of toward spiritual maturity. Really, based upon um, the text at the head of your program, we who with unveiled face concentrate the Lord's glory are being transformed into his likeness with ever increasing glory. That text was not chosen by myself. But that's our theme. Transformed into his likeness. The text I was thinking of is in Ephesians chapter 3, Paul's great prayer for that church that they might be filled with all the fullness of God. Filled with the fullness of God, transformed into the likeness of Jesus. That's the goal of Christian living. And towards spiritual maturity is really meant to show us that there are various areas of our lives in which we must grow to attain that maturity. We have to grow in faith. We have to grow in suffering. We have to grow in obedience and many others. And uh, we shall be dealing with some of these as the week goes by. But this morning we are commencing with a lesson on faith. Last evening our subject was you want to be made whole. Do you really mean that you want God to make you spiritually ma mature? How far do you want Jesus to go with you? The mathematics of spiritual breakdown are 99% commitment to Christ. Is it 100% whole or have we reservations? Well, now, the first thing is to consider growth in faith. And uh, I'm taking this morning this fascinating story, this incident in the ministry of the Lord Jesus, which took place in a vital moment in his ministry. It had become clear by now that um, the Jew had rejected him as their Messiah. And as verse 21 tells us, he departed into the coast of Tyre and Sidon, seeking rest and solitude. And this departure brought the rejection of the Jewish people of Christ right into full view. And it introduces us at the same time to the first Gentile convert. A Canaanite woman, as verse 22 tells us. Mark, in his account of this incident in chapter 7 of his gospel, says she was a Greek, a Syrophoenician woman. And therefore, she was a direct descendant. descendant of those people who were outcasts. The people who had been just swept away in the divine economy of the past because of their sin, in order that God's plan of redemption should be fulfilled through the Jewish people. And this woman was outside the covenant of Israel. She worshipped pagan gods. Yet, Mark tells us in the seventh chapter, verse 24, from such a person Jesus could not be hid. That's an interesting statement. A pagan woman worshipping heathen gods, but Jesus could not be hid from her. Of course, 
if he so desired, he could be hit from anybody. Just make a note of your note, in your note, and I'm trying to speak a little more slowly because we do take notes. I didn't realize that last night. I, sorry, mm -hmm. you are taking notes, I'm grateful. And uh, I would suggest that you just make a note. Mm -hmm. That uh, in John 8, verse 59, we read, he hid himself and went out of the temple going through the midst and passed by. Jesus always hides himself from intellectual pride and orthodox tradition. But he never dealt with two people alike. How he hides himself from orthodoxy and tradition. But he never deals with two people in the same way. Never heals more than one blind man in the same way. Never cast out demons from people in the same way. His approach was always different. A tremendous illustration in his ministry of the variety, the mass of human need and of his absolute capacity to meet it all. It's a parable for all our Christian service. But though his approach to people was different, our approach to him, if it's to prevail, if it's to be vital, if it's to make real contact, is always to be exactly the same. There are two ways to the Lord. Just one. The way of faith, the way of trust. It's possible to be a believer, but not to be a Christian. I hope that doesn't horrify you. As a matter of fact, I hope it does. And shakes you. Because you can believe all the facts and your Bible from cover to cover. You may have been baptized, christened, concerned, vaccinated, all the rest. You can have had everything done to you, and yet never, never truly be born of God's Spirit. There's a tremendous difference between belief and trust. And uh, these are the ways in which I must come to you. But I'm not interested really in the technicalities of this story. I am interested in it as a tremendous revelation of the triumph of this woman's faith over every discouragement, her refusal to be put off. It's a record of faith holding on to the Lord in sheer desperation, clinging like a drowning man clinging to the life source with not a thing to hold on to, recognizing that there wasn't the least bit of hope anywhere else. None but he could save her child, who was so feverishly, so severely possessed by a demon. It's a record also of her faith overcoming obstacles which Jesus put in her way. Overcoming obstacles which Jesus put in her way how absolutely impossible it was for her to understand what he was doing with her. But she held on until her need was met. Have you realized, have I, that faith works best in the context of desperation? Just take a moment to digest that. <laughs> it does. It works best in the context of desperation. After all, what's the use of kind of faith which trusts so far but leaves a way of escape, a loophole, in case Jesus doesn't work? Sometimes we are, I have been, absolutely bewildered, absolutely perplexed by the way he's dealt with me. 
but it's a good thing to look back upon the time of testing and begin to understand. Of course, that will never be completely true until, until we reach heaven. Then we shall understand completely, as we can't possibly understand right now. Then, perhaps, we'll begin to appreciate so clearly the reason for it all. I want you to notice, to begin with, that there are four times in this account we read, he answered her. Verse 23, he answered her, not a word. That's the answer of denial. Verse 24, he answered her and said, I am only sent to the lost sheep of Israel. That's the answer of discouragement. Verse 26, he answered and said, it is not fair to take the children's bread, to throw it to dogs. That's the answer of disillusionment. Verse 28, he answered and said, O woman, great is your faith. Be it done for you, even as you, des as you desire. And her daughter was healed from that very hour. That's the answer of deliverance. Have you got that? Let me just give it them to be sure, because I want you to come travel along with me. A convoy can only go as fast as the slowest ship. And I want to be sure that I have everybody with me. <laughs> and I leave nobody behind. <laughs> First, he answered her, not a word. The answer of denial. Then he answered her, I'm only sent to the lost sheep of Israel. That's the answer of discouragement. Then, verse 26, it isn't fair to take the children's bread and to throw it to dogs. That's the answer of disillusionment. Verse 28, O woman, great is your faith. Be it done for you even as you desire. And her daughter was healed from that very hour. That's the answer of deliverance. See? Towards spiritual maturity, often achieved by denial, often by discouragement, often by disillusionment, but in the end, always by deliverance. And Jesus found a most unlikely case of a living faith in an extraordinary circumstance. In surroundings from which orthodoxy, religion, had withdrawn in condemnation. How empty is intellectual knowledge without faith? Five years in a seminary won't give you what we really need, necessarily. You may have your heart, your, your head filled with knowledge, but your heart emptied of fire, emptied of reality. My apologies to any seminary professor who might be here. Please come and talk to me about that afterwards. <laughs> but the point I'm getting at is this, that the Lord is able to make a strong faith exist where there's little knowledge, little to encourage, and where the surroundings are absolutely dry and barren. The greatest of Christians can live in impossible surroundings. Our Heavenly Father has children everywhere. 
but see how he trains them. Why? Because being our father, he wants us all to have a family likeness. A family likeness. To need mature. A year or two ago, <coughs> just to give you a break from taking notes, a year or two ago, my wife and I were visiting Florida. I think about this time of the year, extraordinary how many preachers get down there in <laughs> January. <laughs> we're looking forward to being there in a couple of weeks' time with, um, at the Moody Keswick Grounds. And we were shown round <coughs> an orange juice factory. Of course, it was the world's largest. Um, three million gallons of orange juice sent from that factory throughout the United States every week. I guess you know that Tropicana is its name. And the slogan of Tropicana is, if it's not in the orange, it's not in Tropicana. At that time of the year, masses of oranges were coming into the factory and being dumped in trucks. And uh, this, of course, being the season for uh, the production of them. And we were shown around the factory. It was really quite amazing. Because the first thing that happened to those oranges, they were all put in huge piles in the factory, was that an enormous machine on a sort of conveyor belt came along the line, and it stretched out about a hundred arms, each of which grabbed an orange. And then it went a little way further along, fully loaded, and stopped above a tank. And those arms began to squeeze and squeeze and squeak to put the pressure on until every drop of juice had been extracted from those oranges and then went went a little further and sh had amazing capacity to shake itself free of pits and skin and you really think i'm kidding you but i'm not do you know what they were, they were used for pits and skin cattle feed and ladies perfume Quite a remarkable combination. <laughs> and uh, a few moments later, I met the director of that factory, and I said to him, Sir, he's a Christian, Sir, when an orange looks at you, it must turn pale and say, I've had it. <laughs> and he smiled and said, Oh no, you've got it wrong. When an orange looks at me, it smiles and says, at last, I'm going to be useful. The pressure, the testing, the crushing, the breaking, make it useful. Now the Lord is after each one of us this day, today, this very day in January. He's in business with that process to produce spiritual material. Exciting. Producing a family likeness. Let's see, therefore, how this took place in this woman's life. Verse 23. Have mercy on me, O Lord, thou son of David, my daughter. Mark puts it rather more intimately and says, my little daughter. My daughter is severely possessed by a demon. Silence. What? Crying? Silence. To a cry like that? It almost seems to contradict the whole message of the gospel. She'd thrown herself at his feet. The need was urgent. Her heart was tender, yet he passed her by. Was that silence a denial? How often we've assumed that it is. How often? <coughs> How often we've said in similar circumstances, what's the use of Christ? 
There's not a sign of an answer ever. Prayer doesn't work. Nothing seems to happen at the other end of the line. What's the use? And prayer doesn't seem to reach higher than the ceiling. Situation unchanged. But wait a minute. How did she come to Jesus? Thou son of David. She'd appealed to him as the Messiah of the Jews. And as a Gentile, she had no claim on him. In that capacity. Was that why he was silent? Or was it he was so delighted, so thrilled, so, may I say reverently, so excited by her faith that he was determined to test it and prove it to see if she came out like pure gold. I don't know. Probably the answer is in both questions. But this much I do know, that God's silences are never denials. Never. He never has engaged, busy, on his door. He does have files in his cabinet marked pending. But they're not forgotten. It's often his way of discipline. They're always wanting instant experience. It may be true that we have come to him on the wrong ground. And we have to remember that there's only one ground all our life of approach to him. That is Calvary, the blood of Jesus, the atonement. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 19. Having brethren boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus by a new and living way, which he hath consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say his flesh, and having a high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith. That's the way. It's the way all through our life. It's not just the way to be saved, it's the way to maintain salvation. I don't come to the cross as a sinner to go through it. I meet God in Jesus at the cross to stay there. It's not, it's not that the church today needs to get on to Pentecost. No, it's to get back to Calvary. And if the church gets back to Calvary, Pentecost is inevitable. And that's the way for any of us to come. God forbid, my dear friend, that you and I, any of us, should think we've become too big to go that way. You know, we've been 40, 50 years on the road now, and we really know quite a lot. You know, we've got a position of leadership in the church, after all, and people must respect it. Hmm. <laughs> An elder of a Baptist church in New Jersey called me on the telephone at Moody Church in Chicago one day and said to me, we're looking up for a pastor. Can you anybody around, do you know, in Chicago area who might consider the coming? And I thought and gave him the names of three friends of mine. And then he began to ask me questions. I'll never in my life forget the conversation. It went on for 45 minutes. I didn't mind, he was going for a call. <laughs> but oh boy. You know, this is a conversation. Now tell me just a minute about man number one. Uh, what, um, uh, what school did you attend? What um, college did you then go to? And what university? And what degrees has he got? And what did he major in? What are his special gifts? On and on and on. Like and I answered the questions as best I knew how for all three of those fellows. And then he said, after three quarters of an hour, well, thank you very much, Pastor Peter. But uh, none of those men are big enough for our purpose. Hold it, sir. Hold it. 
just before you go off the line. Are you quite sure you don't mean that they're not small enough? Fancy being too big. Not big enough. Trouble is, we get too big for God to use it. Because we're always wanting 10% of the commission. 10% of the glory for ourselves. Having said that, however, make sure, won't you, that God's silence to your prayer is not because you come to him on some other ground than Calvary. Make sure of that. He may be testing you, but he will never deny you if you come the Calvary road. It's through the Lord Jesus and faith in him alone that we have access into the adequacy of the grace of God in which we stand. God forbid that any of us should ever be too big to come that way. God's silences are not denial. The second thing I notice here is the answer of discouragement. Verse 23 and 24. His disciples came and begged him, saying, Send her away. She's crying after us. He answered, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Those disciples rather present a picture which becomes uncomfortably close. To them, this woman was just a nuisance. Peter, I would imagine it would be he. I apologize to him that I'm wrong one day. But uh, he was usually the spokesman. He would probably scowl at her. John became impatient, and the rest sort of very presumptuous. Send her away. She cries after us. Now, Peter, hold it. Don't think yourself so important. Don't imagine you're somebody because she isn't crying after you at all. It's a great pity when the disciple thinks that people come to hear him. Who cares for our poor talking? It's Jesus I need. And if I don't get him out of these days, I've got nothing. But I simply have a few sermon notes. Won't do me any good. And how often I've repelled and pressed you have other people with cold words, unkind behavior, unsympathetic treatment. But she didn't let any of that keep her from pressing her claim. Uncle, and dear friend, please follow her example, won't you? Don't let the treatment you receive from the hands of other Christians keep you back from Jesus. I'll just say that again. Don't let the treatment you receive at the hands of other Christians keep you back from him. But even Christ's answer was discouraging. It indeed did seem to cut her off from every bit of hope. She was not of the house of Israel. No. She wasn't, but she was one of the lost sheep. And Jesus said in John 10 and verse 16, Other sheep I have, which are not of this fold, them also I must bring. Maybe she'd heard him hear that, say that. And she was clinging to those few words, and she cried, Lord, help me. As one of your lost sheep, Lord, please come out of the fold and just help me. And may I just uh, tread on thin ice a moment? Uh, theologically, I mean.
are not predestined to eternal life. What to our Lord was sent only to the house of Israel, to the house of Israel after the flesh, not after the flesh, but after the spirit. And therefore, this woman was included when she thought herself shut out. Election is clearly taught in Scripture, but your election, my friend, is in Jesus. There isn't anybody, anybody, anywhere, who's come on the ground of the blood of Jesus to God, who's ever been excluded. He is not willing that one should say. And at that moment, at that moment, when I put my faith in him, at that moment I passed from the non-elect to the elect. It's the eighth person, that great Baptist preacher, a couple of generations ago, who said, when you come up towards the gate of heaven, you know who's written on the outside, whosoever will may come. And when you get in and look around, you see written on the inside, chosen in him from the foundation of the world. Tremendous truth. Ask me to explain, I can't. Ask anybody to explain, I can't. I can't. If God could uh, be understood, small enough to be understood, he's not big enough to worship. And there are some things, some tools that I don't understand. Many of them, and that's one of them. But I'm so thankful this morning to say in the depths of my heart, I know, I know, that my salvation does not rest upon a decision I made for Christ. It rests in the fact that for some reason he chose me. Chosen in him from the foundation of the world. And yet, a moment when he called upon me to repent, change my way, change my behavior, and turn and find him. The answer of discouragement. Now the answer of disillusionment, verses 26 and 27. She came, verse 25, she came and knelt before him saying, Lord, help me. And he answered, it isn't fair to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. And she said, yes, Lord, yet even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. The answer of disillusionment, I imagine that must have been always almost worse than the answer of silence. To the Jew, the Gentile was a dog. But not only placed her outside any relationship with the Lord, apparently, but it made it clear that she was absolutely unworthy in herself of receiving anything from him. Please notice that. Not merely outside a covenant relationship with Israel, but absolutely unworthy of receiving a thing from him. Only a dog. And she didn't dispute it. True Lord, she said, I haven't any merit. I have no right to come to you. Just a desperate need in my heart and in my life. I know it, it, it wouldn't be fitting for one of your children to be deprived of anything on my account. I know it. Yet, though you call me a dog, you're my Lord. Lord, help me. Not only, I think it's amazing, does she not dispute with him, but she worships the hand that and bows reverently before the one who speaks so severely, sternly to him. Doesn't complain. Doesn't growl. She worships the hand that hates her fallen. And bows reverently before the one who speaks to her so sternly. How differently I behave when God put this chastening hand. Why? 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 Christians are wonderful people when we talk together about our faith 
But when we talk together about our troubles, you really wonder if there's any difference between us and those who didn't know Jesus. And out of that, I want just to say to you, and to you to get hold of it, even though I feel you feel as unworthy as she is, as disillusioned as she did concerning any goodness in herself, please remember, your salvation does not rest upon anything that you are at all, or ever can be. Jesus doesn't bless me because of how good I am, but because I come to him as a beggar. The greatest of saints are the greatest receivers. And I've come to him as said, Nothing in my hand I bear. Simply to thy cross. I say, I need to be saved not by myself, but from myself. Get then, with its implication, not merely by myself, but from myself. From any bit of remaining of comfort that there's anything I can do to add to what Jesus has done for me. Oh, what a lesson. It should be simple, but I'm telling you, I'm still in the kindergarten. Now, for me to be empty, that the Lord might fill me. It's for him for me to confess my utter sinfulness that he may cleanse me. It's for me to be absolutely nothing that he may be everything to me. Never allow the sense of blackness, failure, breakdown to keep me from believing prayer. All his dealings with me are designed to show that in me dwells no good thing. And faith, as it grows and matures, accepts the verdict of God's word upon myself. Struggling as a young man with myself, that thing to be a better Christian in the early days of Christian life, striving very hard to improve. I listened one day in London to my lifelong friend, Ian Thomas, whom some of you may have met. And in the course of his message, he says, what do you think God expects of you? And I just cringed in my chair. I imagined that the next word would be, oh, some tremendous person with a tremendous faith and, you know, outstanding ability. And I felt I wasn't even a candidate. What does God expect of you? And I think waited for an answer, which he didn't get. He gave it himself. Total failure. And I absolutely sat up both up there. Boy, I'm a candidate for that. <laughs> Total failure. You're a rush out, said Ian Thomas. There's nothing in you at all to commend yourself to the Lord. A total failure. There wouldn't be a cross in history if that wasn't true. As I worked that out, I thought to myself, that's it. God is never in the self-improvement plan. He's always in the Christ replacement plan. Got it? Oh, if you want to stop and say, hallelujah. And how many years Christian people spend, even Christian leaders, in trying to make themselves better. And the end is result in drinking masses of coffee, taking drugs, consulting a psychiatrist, trying to improve this self, which it cannot be improved, and always remains exactly the same hopeless thing. But, uh, listen, Jesus is exactly the opposite to all that I am. If I could ask you, wouldn't we have a wonderful list to put down on a bit of paper your weakness, your fundamental weakness in life, or weaknesses in plural. And you wrote that down, my word, if you told the truth, what a shock that would give to conference. <laughs> wouldn't it? Well, listen, you don't be afraid of it. Just 
recognize that Jesus knows all about that. All about it. And he's exactly the opposite to all of that. Is your weakness in pure thinking? Keep holy. Is your weakness criticism and kindness of other people? Keep love and gentle. Whatever it is, he's the opposite. And all he wants to do is to say, and excuse the apparent irreverence, just you kindly get out of the way and let me get right in and go to this. In producing the opposite in you. Jesus expects nothing but failure. But hallelujah, he's given us the Holy Spirit that we need never fail. Not that we cannot fail, but that we need never fail. And where some of us, and I simply speak uh, honestly, openly to you, because I know this mess, because I've been in it, persistently go on struggling to handle our weaknesses and really, really, nearly, nearly drive ourselves to climb up the wall and attacking them. And all the time, I suddenly discover that my business as a Christian is not, is not to struggle to care for my weak points. It is to concentrate on my strong points, my relationship to the Lord Jesus. As I concentrate on him, he cares for my weak points. Every year in life, Satan gets at you. And by the way, don't you think that the Christian life gets easier when you get older, it doesn't. It's tough. And every day the devil's on our track. Praise the Lord, there's things you worth bothering about. And what is your reaction? What is my reaction? To square my shoulders and clench my teeth and fight back on them. Not now. My reaction is when impure thoughts come to my mind, Lord, Lord, this is the life beyond the cross from which you died to save me. Lord Jesus, thank you for your holiness right now. I take it. Lord, I'm about to blow my top with my wife and let her have it. Lord, thank you for your patience and your love. Thank you the opposite to it all, that I only, only, only know so much of the grace and sufficiency of Jesus Christ as by faith, I say, maturity of faith. And you see, there's no way to find peace with God to refuse to admit the truth of what he says about me. That's what they're trying to do all the time. To refuse to admit that we're not getting better. I don't want to shock you, but it's the truth. There isn't one thing in the universe that I'm not capable of committing two minutes after this meeting is over, but for the grace of God. The only good thing about me is Jesus. And that's true of it all. It's an admission to that, and healing to that, and thanks for accepting that, thank you all, which has allowed the devil to show me that, that gives me the basis of relief from that place. But you notice something? Though she didn't dispute, she pressed home her claim by argument. She saw just a little gleam of hope. There are two words in the New Testament for dog. One is a scavenger dog of the street. The other, a little dog of the household, that sits and usually at the feet of the children beside the table and eats a crumb that falls on the ground. And this was the word that Jesus used. And so this woman flung herself upon the mercy of the Lord and began to argue. I love that. She wouldn't be put off, fancy or argue, on the basis of that one word. Ooh, what they. People never dispute with God, but you'll argue with them. 
She took the word out of his mouth, accepted his statement. He thought, I'm only a little dog. Because, but because I'm a little dog, I have a claim upon you. It wouldn't be right to take the children's bread and throw it to dogs. No, because the dogs are already provided for. They eat the crumbs that fall from the master's table. It would be quite wrong to give them the children's bread. They have their, their own share when the crumbs fall. Lord, that's all I want, just a crumb. Not children's bread, but just a crumb. Lord, help me. See how she reacted to the answer of disillusionment? I can take that attitude also. Lord, I, I accept your verdict. No good thing in myself. I agree with that. But Lord, I'm under the sound of your word. And if I'm hearing it, really hearing it, can't I be a receiver of it too? I'm your property. I'm your own. And there's enough of your overflowing mercy for all your children. And Lord, if you bless me here at Lakeway, you won't be any poorer. You're just as rich as ever. And just able to cleanse with ever. What arguments I can bring to thee. From the very depths, is that a sense? From the sense of desperation, desperate need, faith begins to mature and shakes off the apparent disillusion. I can't qualify. Lord, give me just a crumb. And uh, finally, I remind you that Paul wrote the letter to the Philippian church. And in chapter 3, when he was halfway through, verse 1, he said, finally, brethren. He became the father of all preachers who, by saying that, indicate they're getting a second wind. But um, I won't quite treat you like that, but oh dear, such a burden yet to discharge. You're so patient. The answer of deliverance in verse 28. O oh, woman, great is your faith, be it done for you as you desire. And her daughter was healed instantly. It was just as if the Lord Jesus surrendered to the conquering power of her faith. He gave in. She gained the point. Her prayer was answered. He tried her. Tested her. Proved her. And her faith came forth as pure gold. And what a comfort to those people who think there's no hope. Things have gone too far, too bad. Oh, yes, I prayed, but it's given up now. I've attempted reformation and improvement, but it's been a failure. But I haven't really started, I acknowledge it, I haven't really started clinging to the cross. Brother, if the earth sinks and storms rage, hang on. Clear on. You can't tell us there. What a challenge. What a challenge to our prayer for other people. Especially our family. She prayed for her little daughter. How do you pray for your family? Do you? Together? Husband and wife? In the average church, Christianity today reported recently, the average church in Britain and the States with the total membership role, five percent don't exist. Ten percent never come to church. I'm sorry, ten percent can't be found. Twenty five percent never come to church. Fifty percent is no missionary interest. Seventy five percent never come to midweek service and prayer meeting. Ninety percent never have family worship. And 95% never win anybody to Jesus. Can you wonder? 
were in the flat there. Ninety percent, no family worship. How do you praise your children? I won't mention names, of course, or places, but I went to one place, not so long ago. Three o'clock, three thirty in the afternoon, three rip roaring teenager kids came dashing home from school, flew down there uh, what they had from school, and dashed to the refrigerator, pulled out a can of coke, and went to the TV room and never seen for the rest of the day. No contact with parents at all. And that man, a Christian leader in the town in which he lived. Too busy, too concerned about dollars and money to care for the family. And the other home, I arrived late at night, having traveled a long way, I got a car, went to bed. And the next morning, about 6 a.m., I heard an alarm bell ring and the scurry of matches of feet. So I thought I'd better join in the rush. I went downstairs and I arrived in the table tennis room and found the whole family sitting around the table tennis table. I only was there one night. I'm not quite sure whether there were 10 children or 11. Quite a team. And I squeezed in between number 10 and 11. I was told that they had an age from 24 to 4. They all had strange things in their hair. The girls, I don't know what it was called. <laughs> and the fellows were half-dressed. and But they were all there. And at the end of the table was Father and an open Bible. And he read a chapter from the Word. Then he gave every one of those children a missionary film to pray. We came round and knelt at our chairs and prayed. By the time it came to my turn, I found I was emotionally involved. It was like a, an ante room to heaven. Because all those children knew exactly where that missionary was, what they were doing, what their work was. And they prayed in faith. The whole exercise took about uh, three quarters of an hour. That man was a practicing surgeon. He for crisis surgery to conduct a crisis surgery, surgery operation in about an hour's time. He could easily, easily have rejected all that, but he didn't. He put his priority back. And there's no greater priority in Christian life than the faith which prays for our children, husband and wife together, and which keeps a home an even here. In Britain, there's a church of Satan. A few months ago, that church of Satan in Yorkshire had a day of prayer and fasting for the destruction of Christian families. The church of Satan, you've heard of Canterbury Cathedral, the headquarters of the Anglican Church, much more a museum, alas, than anything. But very famous old building, there it stands, a beautiful place, and you know that exactly opposite to the front door on the opposite side of the street, the Church of Satan has opened a shop for sale of their literature. That's what we're up against in Western civilization today. How do I pray for others? How do I pray for my children? What a lesson. And what a great lesson there is here in the effect of faith in blessing. Just look at verses 30 and 31, would you? Great crowds came to him, bringing with them the lame, the men, the blind, the dumb, and many others, and the put him at his feet, and he healed them. So the strong wondered when they saw the dumb speaking, the men whole, the lame walking, and the blind seeing, they glorified the God of Israel. <laughs> Jesus had departed from that particular scene, and Mark tells us that he took a circuitous route to the Catholic, and but he's still outside Jewish territory, and the mother of you, Kendra. Mm -hmm. He healed them. The same grace for which that woman pleaded, pleaded so hard, came in a tremendous flow, unasked. She wrung out of him a drop, a crumb. Now it gushes out in abundance. He got 
crumbs with a great deal of pleading, they got bread. But apparently nothing. All that you're asking. Say, I can't tell you this, but it, it, it excites me. Do you think her faith had proved in Texas? Do you think it had created faith in other people? Jesus has no problems in the presence of a living faith. And whenever people come to him with a great big burden and cast it at his feet, they experience his delivering power. The testing of faith. And brother and sister, a faith that isn't worth testing is not worth having. It isn't, you know, not worth having. Is your faith being tested right now? Praise the Lord. It hasn't been easy to speak this word to you today, but I felt it is so absolutely essential to spiritual maturity. And I'll tell you why. Because I, I must be honest, I don't come around to just little sermonettes to Christianettes. Because <laughs> I know that I'm dependent entirely upon God's grace and that grace would never come to me if I wasn't honest with people. And I shall learn some of the lessons that I'm still learning some years ago, long after I've been in the ministry. I had left Moody Church, gone back home to Edinburgh, to pastor a large Baptist church there. The church was full. I hadn't filled it. Sir Baxter had. Joe Griffiths, Graham Scroggie. I was just benefiting from all that. But I had some intent. And I was working hard. One Saturday afternoon, I was sitting at my desk, finalizing preparation for a message, when suddenly I lost control of my hand. And I tried to stand up, couldn't. I tried to speak, I'd lost my speech. The confusion was heard downstairs, my wife heard it, and my older daughter, who has now been 15 years with the African Mission in Central Africa Republic, she and her husband and one or two children, I can't remember. I mean, they uh, three now, but uh, I don't remember just that point. They were on their way to leave with a valedictory service the following week. And she's a nurse. And she flashed upstairs, and of course, she knew that I had a cerebral hemorrhage or a stroke. And, uh, I was flat on my back, reduced in my mid fifties from being healthy, fit, never having had anything worse than flu, to being a cabbage, useless. And I was put to bed for examination. And I reacted in exactly the way I told people that they should never react <laughs> and preach. And I said, you should never ask why. I asked why. My mind was perfectly clear, even though I couldn't express my thoughts. Why? Lord, why have you allowed the devil to do this? Why? Why is that? What's the church going to do? I mean, how do we get on with them? Yeah? That's what you think. Got a lot, on a lot better, actually. But why is he allowed it? It's all wrong. And I turned completely sour, and I didn't open my Bible, nor did I pray for about three months. One day, I opened my Bible. Can't think why. But I opened it, and it fell open. And the first verse I hit, I, I hit, was in Psalm 39. Thy stroke has consumed me. 
I am consumed by the blow of your hand. And in a flash, I thought, oh, I spent months blaming the wrong person, accusing the devil. He didn't seem to do this. The Lord had done it to me. And I saw it. That didn't make me well. But it seemed as if a voice which had grown strangely unfamiliar in recent months suddenly spoke to me and said, Go through your Christian life for the past 20 years and just see what's been happening. Well, of course, that plenty of time. And I did just that. And I found in God's presence that I could never, never get back to Him unless I was open and honest with Him. And I found that work had taken over from worship. In early days, oh, there had been such a disciplined prayer life. In early days, such a disciplined quiet time. So many hours spent in worship of God. Hold on. After now, I recall looking back on Sundays at 11 o'clock and having to say something, but having nothing to say. Often demanding, demanding from a congregation an obedience, a, a submission that I wasn't prepared to give myself. I put work before worship. I thought it was so spiritual to work for the Lord seven days a week. Often had twinges. Came home occasionally to see my wife and family at uh, in the early evening, very occasionally. I left home every day from Buddy Church at quarter past seven. Went to the church office at eight. Was all through the morning and all through the afternoon and served an endless committee. Oh dear, I'd never been on one for ten years. Praise the Lord! I served an endless committee, one after another. I thought it was so spiritual, it was downright sin. And I sometimes, when I did go home, saw two children and my wife. And one or other of the children would say, Well, Daddy, you will now to another meeting tonight. And I knew it was wrong. I had to say, Yes. I put work before worship. I put orthodoxy before obedience. So very proud of being pastor of a big American church. It was so fundamental and dispensational. I wasn't, but they were. And uh, it was very, very sound and, uh, you know, very proud of that. Yes, work before worship and orthodoxy before obedience. And when I saw the truth, brothers and sisters, I could only cry. I spent a week, a week, in my conscious moments, just crying my eyes out. How I've blown it. How I've blown it. Sorry, Lord, I see it now. And, oh, and from that moment, from thinking that he looked at me. With tender hands he lifted me. From shades of night to plains of light he lifted me. Mm. The specialist who came to examine me said, uh, Well, is it um, you know, the hemorrhage is just lucky for you. Stop at a very critical spot. If you don't work anymore, you can live to be 90. If you start and work again, well, I'll give you five years. Possibly ten, which you certainly won't live to your seventy. I'd like to have a word with that man, <laughs> because that all happened seventeen years ago. How good is a God? I do. But faith was challenged. But through all all of that, looking back in hindsight, I wouldn't have missed it for anything. Jesus has become all the more real. He's the one who matters more than anything to me. I won't say that to sort of about to publish a book on humility and how I found it <laughs> with six personal photographs in. <laughs> but I do tell it to you simply because 
I want you to know if anybody here is down at rock bottom, I've been there too. And if anybody there...